In the last video, we began motivating the need for uh, time-dependent perturbation theory. And um, ultimately, our goal is to develop a way to solve the Schrodinger equation, the general Schrodinger equation for a time-dependent Hamiltonian. In this video, we uh, built the framework of time-dependent perturbation theory uh, in, in general. So uh, to be able to do that, we're going to use uh, this parameter lambda, which we saw before in time-independent perturbation theory as a knob for turning on and off the perturbation or for tuning the perturbation. This will allow us to uh, develop a certain quantity into a perturbative power series expansion, uh, after which point we can calculate successive orders in that expansion, depending on the type of accuracy that we want or need. So our starting point is um, the fact that for a time independent Hamiltonian, H naught, um, the stationary state, so the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian uh, form a complete and orthonormal basis. And what this means is uh, we were able to write uh, the general state of a system for a time independent Hamiltonian as a linear superposition of the stationary states. So here CK is, uh, these are our coefficients in the, um, in our linear combination of stationary states. We had uh, a simple time dependence because we were able to uncouple the position and time component of the wave function for the case where our Hamiltonian didn't depend on time. And we had uh, our stationary state. Okay, so again, what this is saying is any state of our quantum system, which has a time independent Hamiltonian could be written as a linear superposition of the stationary states or of the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. So here K just stands for, uh, it could be one, two, N, etc. It's just a way to denote our stationary states. All right, so here uh, CK gave us uh, what's usually called the probability amplitude. of being in a particular uh, eigenstate k. If you take the square modulus of the coefficients, that gives you the probability of being in a particular state, All right? And that interpretation is going to be uh, very important to us. Okay, so Building on this idea, we can say, uh, or we can make the educated guess that for a time dependent Hamiltonian, uh, the stationary states, even though they're no longer eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, they still form a complete and orthonormal basis. So we can still write our quantum state as a linear superposition of stationary states with uh, an added complication. Okay, so here I'm denoting by capital Psi 
the state for a time dependent Hamiltonian, whereas the lowercase psi was for a time independent Hamiltonian. So here we're saying we can still do this because the time dependence hasn't affected the fact that the stationary states form a complete basis. But now to incorporate the more complicated time dependence introduced by the Hamiltonian, we are going to make the coefficients themselves uh, time dependent. Okay, so that's the main difference between a time independent problem and a time dependent problem. The expansion remains the same. The coefficients here are independent of time. The coefficients here are, will depend on time. However, the interpretation of these coefficients still doesn't change, meaning that uh, the square modulus of each one of those uh, CKs, they tell you the probability of being in state K at some particular time T. And if you recall, our original motivation is we were interested in uh, finding the probability of being in a particular state after some time T, given that we started off in a different state. So uh, this interpretation is, is going to be very important to us. Uh, another motivation for taking this type of expansion is uh, in the limit over here where lambda goes to zero or in the limit where we turn off the time dependent perturbation, this expansion will converge to this one over here. So that's a useful sanity check. If you were to turn off or take away the time dependence, uh, we should go back to the, the case of a time independent Hamiltonian. Okay, so the only thing left to do now is take this uh, assumption or this educated guess and plug it into our Schrodinger equation and see what we get. So I'll skip a few steps, but this is, uh, this first two terms are what you get from taking the time derivative. Okay, so this first part is you, we have two time dependent terms. So we expect by the product rule to get two terms. This first one is taking the time derivative of the coefficient. And the second term comes from uh, taking the time derivative of this term over here. Here, the IH bars have canceled out with the IH bar from uh, taking the derivative of the exponential. This uh, inner Schrodinger equation, we said has to be equal to our Hamiltonian, which we're assuming takes on this form times the state of our system. So plugging this expansion in on that side So this first term over here comes from uh, the fact that our first part of the Hamiltonian 
is this time independent portion. And remember, we're assuming that we know the solution to the time independent Schrodinger equation for this case. So this means that when the time independent Hamiltonian acts on one of the stationary states, we get back the energy of that state times uh, that stationary state. Okay, so that's where this EK comes from. It comes from the Hamiltonian acting on this state K. Uh, to this, we also have our time dependent perturbation. So we have lambda delta h hat t. Uh, this is an operator, so it has to act on the state. And these other quantities have been shifted because they're ultimately constants. The operator doesn't act on these. Uh, we could have written them on the other side if we, if we wanted to. Okay, so again, plugging in our assumption for expansion over here into the Schrodinger equation, we get the following quantities. You can already see that this term over here cancels out with this term. And we need a way of getting rid of these sums because these sums are complicating things. So what we'll do is we're going to take advantage of the orthonormality of the stationary states. And we're going to act on both sides by the bra of the stationary state N. Okay, and what you'll see is uh, bra n with cat k will give you a character delta, which will collapse this sum. On this side, you have an operator, so the bra can't act directly over here, but it will instead give you uh, a matrix element. All right. So if I were to rewrite our equation with the bra n, Okay, so that's our first term. Notice that the bra is able to pass through the sum and these two variables because these are uh, essentially just numbers. Okay, so we can always take out numbers out of uh, a bra or a cat. We can move them around those, uh, a bra or a cat. On the other side, we have a sum over the stationary states. Uh, the bra of n can't surpass this delta h because it's an operator. So we get a quantity that looks like this. we end up with uh, something that looks like that. This over here, this will be equal to delta and k because stationary states are orthonormal to one another. So this is zero when n is not equal to k and it's equal to one when n is equal to k. Uh, that means that the only term that survives in the sum is when n is equal to k. On this side, we're left with this. And on this side, there's nothing else to do. 
uh, we can call this quantity delta h hat n k of t, uh, just like we did for time independent perturbation theory. And the last thing we can do is shift this exponential over to the other side. And for that, it will be useful to define the frequency omega and k as en minus ek over h bar. And we're left with this equation. So we have for every coefficient Cn, we have a differential equation, which in theory, we will need to solve uh, to find what each one of these coefficients are. The difficulty here is the derivative of Cn will eventually depend on Cn itself. Because remember, k can take on any value, one, two, three, n, et cetera. Uh, so it doesn't look like we've done much. The important thing to note here is this equation is completely equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. Okay, we've only assumed the form for the solution. We haven't made any approximations so far. The difficulty is uh, it's very difficult to solve because it's a coupled differential equation. Okay, so in the next video, we'll see how we can use this perturbative parameter lambda as a justification to um, expand these coefficients into a power series in lambda. And this will allow us to, um, in iteration, solve for the different orders of these coefficients. So this is uh, Cn. This is a K over here. This is a K as well. All right, so we'll uh, in earnest, I guess, begin looking at a perturbative series expansion in the next video.